what is it that makes for an outstanding tactical game? Certainly, it needs to have some of the features that all amazing games have, among them progression of some sort of campaign or some sort of persistent experience that allows the game to continue to be valuable over time. And for that reason, it has a high degree of replayability and interesting content that players can continue to experience. Certainly though, tactical games also have a separate set of qualifying features. Among them is an extremely high lethality rate and an extremely low and punishing time to kill, as well as consequences for those mistakes. So when you get knocked out of the fight, perhaps that destroys an entire campaign or you have a permanent death feature that takes an operator out of the fight for the duration of your experience. Or maybe in a multiplayer scenario, that means it's gonna take a while for you to get back into the fight, or perhaps the loss of a single player has a profound impact on the outcome of an overall player versus player experience. There's a high degree of authenticity and realism expected in tactical games. And that's really kind of what I wanted to focus on today. It's that exceptional level of detail and features that make a tactical game authentic and realistic. Today, I want to talk about weapon manipulation and weapon mechanics. I also want to talk about fire support and medical skills and kit customization and some of these tiny details that make the best tactical games extremely exceptional and fun to play. And I don't talk a whole lot about what I've done in my personal life, but I think it's important to mention today that I'm going to be leaning heavily on about 10 years of active duty army experience. About half of that has been spent in U.S. Army Special Operations, and I'm going to be leaning a lot on those experiences to inform some of the information that I share with you guys today and focus on some of those things that make a tactical game truly exceptional. In doing that, I'm also going to be sharing some footage from the archives. So we're going to be looking at some games that I haven't featured on the channel in quite some time, but nonetheless, I think are relevant to our discussion. I'm also going to be showing you some footage from the range and some real world firearms kind of stuff so that we can look at what this thing actually looks like in real life. I'm also going to be talking a little bit about my experience at various military simulation events and how those experiences do a great job of illustrating the features that we're talking about in these games. To that end, because we are doing a little bit of firearm show and tell, it's safe to assume that this video is going to be demonetized. And for that reason, I'd invite you guys to consider becoming a member of the channel by simply clicking that blue join button down below if you wanna support my content and get more stuff just like this. I'd also invite you guys to take a look at my game store over at nexus.gg slash controlled pairs gaming. All the games, well, most of the games that we're talking about today are featured over on my game store. You can purchase them from there. You'll immediately get a redeemable key that you can take over to Steam and immediately download the game. And a portion of your purchase will go to benefit the channel directly. Here we go. The first set of features I wanna talk about when it comes to tactical games is weapon manipulation. And the first subset of weapon manipulation that I think is critically important is muzzle awareness. In real life, you don't point your gun at your friends under any circumstance. And this is a great example here from the Copperhead 7 American Milsim event that I attended not long ago. As you can see, I was providing security for my buddy who was employing a grenade through a window and I made exceptional care to put my weapon up at the high port while he was employing that grenade so I wasn't flagging him with my muzzle but nonetheless still prepared to provide security should it be necessary. This is a critical feature in tactical games. Games like Ground Branch, Ready or Not, Arma, and certainly Virtual Reality do it extremely well. Ground Branch probably does it the best. It allows you to go to both the high port and the low port to avoid flagging your friends. Ready or Not has a more simple implementation where you can actually use the mouse wheel if you customize it in such a way to lower your weapon to the low port to avoid flagging your buddies. Arma requires mods to do this, and it can be kind of a pain in the butt to download the right mods to get the right experience, but there's nothing quite like Arma when you get the game tuned just right to deliver the exact experience that you were going for. But virtual reality is really the king 
of weapon manipulation because you're in this extremely immersive three-dimensional virtual reality environment and in my case i actually hold a 3D printed, you know, physical gun stock that my controllers attach to. And I can use that thing to, you know, go up to the high port, go down to the low port or the low ready and make sure that my weapon is never flagging my friends. That's why muzzle awareness is such a critical component to all of these phenomenal tactical games. Next thing I want to talk to you guys about is weapon attachment functionality. And what I mean by that is all of the things that you put on your gun, the light, the laser, the optic. How do those things interact with the player and how do they interact with the gun itself? Again, ground branch is kind of king of the weapon attachment scene. And let me demonstrate real quick exactly how important this is. This is my Mark 18. This is the pistol variant, but as you guys all know, Mark 18 is certainly, you know, my preferred firearm. It's a 10.3 inch barrel. Um, the Mark 18 is by Daniel Defense. It's also adopted by US SOCOM as the short barreled carbine of choice for American Special Operations Forces. And on this Mark 18, I have an EOTech EXPS3. Um, I've got a SIG 3x magnifier behind it on a Unity flip to center um, riser. And then I've also got a laser up front by Steiner and then a Surefire Scout light. So there's a lot going on on this firearm. And the light and the laser is really what I want to focus in on. You'll see here, I've got a set of two buttons. One of these buttons fires the light and the other one of the buttons fires the laser. When I press the button down, the light will deploy and actually go off and you guys can kind of see that there. And if I let go, the light turns off. If I double tap it, the light will stay on. And if I press it one more time, the light will turn off. Same thing goes for the laser. You can't see this laser because we don't have night vision on in this video right now, but it, the functionality works exactly the same. If I push the button, the laser fires and I can see my point of aim. If I release the button, the laser turns off. If I double tap it, it'll stay on permanently. Most folks just do that quick press and release to fire the light or the laser as needed. And games that implement this correctly allow for phenomenal manipulation of the environment and the weapon system to complement the gameplay. Ground Branch does a phenomenal job of this, allowing you to actually bind your mouse keys to achieve the exact same effect that I've described here. Um, Ready or Not has similar implementation and you can bind the buttons to the mouse to allow you to achieve a press and hold and then release to turn the laser on and off. But unfortunately, Ready or Not only allows you to have either a light or a laser. They haven't implemented a dual feature quite yet. Whereas in Ground Branch, I can use two mouse buttons on the thumb of my mouse to fire either the light or the laser to complement the marksmanship. Virtual reality has kind of a similar implementation. In Onward, for example, you can either fire the light or the laser or both at the same time, but there's not really a way to do either or in any sort of efficient way. Arma, however, does allow you to achieve this level of customization, but again, because it is Arma, it's a little bit janky and it can be challenging to achieve that level of manipulation. But why does this matter? Well, why would I have an overt light and an IR laser in the same circumstance? Well, there could be a circumstance where I'm going into a lit structure and it's got a lot of overt white light inside the interior of that structure. Certainly under those circumstances, I'd want to put my nods up because that white light is going to flood out my nods. It's going to be extremely bright and difficult to see. So I'm going to go ahead and raise my nods. There's still going to be areas of darkness inside that building. And that's why I want the ability to quickly deploy that white light should I need it. And then if I move back into a dark area, I can go ahead and drop my nods, return to the laser as my primary means of engaging targets should I need to. Now what is true of rifles is also true of pistols. This is my everyday carry Glock 19. And I should mention, of course, that while there's a magazine in these weapons, I've made sure that they are all clear and all of the magazines are empty prior to coming in here. This Glock 19 has a TLR-1S light on it as well. It has a toggle on the back of it. So if I depress that toggle, the light's gonna come on. If I release that toggle, the light's gonna come off. And I also have a Trigicon RMR red dot on top of this thing. So highly customized weapon for exactly what I need it to do. And the beauty of this Trigicon RMR is that it's capable of being fired under nods. So if I'm in a situation where I have um, night vision on and I don't want to give away my position by firing off that white light. I can use this red dot sight with nods without flooding out the nods in order to engage targets. So extremely effective weapon for that reason. And there's some games that do that exceptionally well. Um, Ground Branch, again, is a game that achieves this to extremely high degree. In Ground Branch, you can actually manipulate how bright your red dot optic is in the game. And if you turn it down far enough and then drop nods and aim down sights, you're able to see your target 
plenty good and they retain that same day and night functionality that you would expect under real world conditions. And a tactical game that nails that is absolutely phenomenal. Unfortunately, there are some games that prohibit you from aiming down sights while under nods or whenever you do it, your nods magically go up. Arma is an example of this in the vanilla versions of the game. However, again, you can mod it and allow those nods to stay down so that you do get that full immersive experience. And while we're here, and while I have my Glock 19 everyday carry out, I want to take a second to recognize my buddies over at Neomag. Neomag has been a sponsor of the channel for a really long time. They provide phenomenal everyday carry products that allow you to increase the capability of your concealed carry handgun while you're moving about your life to protect yourself, your community, and your family. And one of my favorite products that Neomag offers is their original Neomag clip. In this case, the Neomag clip allows me to carry an extra magazine in my pocket. So I've got this extra Glock 19 magazine, again, empty in my pocket. And the reason I'm able to carry it there is because I'm using their Neomag clip, which has a magnet on it that attaches directly to the magazine. And then it fits in your pocket, just like a pocket knife or a pin would. And you can carry an extra magazine in your pocket. They make some other phenomenal products as well. They just introduced a mechanism that allows you to conceal carry a weapon, even if you're in something that doesn't have belt loops or maybe jogging pants, something like that. So a lot of extremely interesting products that allow you guys to increase your capability. I'd encourage you to check out Neomag. Check out the discount code in the description below and head on over to Neomag to get your hands on one of their original clips or one of their awesome everyday carry products. The next thing I want to talk about when it comes to weapon manipulations is ballistics. And I'm not going to go crazy into like the long range shooting type ballistics, but I, I do want to talk about a concept called height over bore. And height over bore is a simple term used to describe the distance between where the bullet leaves the barrel and the height of the point of aim. In this case, the EOTech EXPS that's on the top of my Mark 18. The distance from where this bullet is sitting in the chamber and the aim point on my EOTech EXPS 3 is 3.44 inches. Why does that matter? Well, whenever this bullet comes out of this rifle, I have it set to a 200 meter zero. That means as the bullet leaves, it's actually gonna begin climbing, but it's gonna take a second for it to climb. It's gonna achieve an arc until the effects of gravity start to bring that bullet down, eventually intersecting with my point of aim at exactly 200 meters where this weapon is zeroed to impact. However, at closer ranges, especially close quarters battle ranges, so we're talking 20 yards and in, the point of aim and the point of impact is extremely profound in the way of it's being that different. And because there's a 3.44 inch difference between my point of aim and where this bullet is actually leaving the barrel and moving down range, I'm gonna see that my bullet is landing lower than my optic whenever I pull the trigger. This means that in CQB situations, I'm actually shooting or I'm aiming over my target to get the bullet to impact exactly where I want. So a lot of games actually simulate height over bore, but none do it better than ground branch in my opinion. And it actually forces you to really consider where you're putting that red dot when you pull the trigger, especially at close ranges. And there's been a couple of times where it saved my butt or potentially uh, caused me to miss a target or cause a injury to a hostage or a no shoot target because I didn't factor in height over bore. And it's just one of those little features that I think is extremely interesting when you see it implemented in a game. And it helps build healthy habits, especially for those shooters among us who enjoy training on our free time or if you carry a weapon as a professional, you don't wanna generate bad habits even if it is just in a game. It's helpful to have a tool that simulates at least pretty authentically what it might be under more realistic conditions. Next, I wanna talk about the manual of arms. The manual of arms is simply how an individual interacts with the controls on their weapon. In an AR pattern rifle, like the My Mark 18, the manual of arms is pretty well known and pretty simple. It's got a magazine release on the right side. If I push that button, the magazine comes out. To load the weapon, I would take this magazine. Again, it's empty. I would put it in the magazine well. I would make sure the weapon is charged by racking the bolt to the rear. Right now, since the weapon is uh, is empty, the bolt catch is actually leaving that bolt open. That's why you see that dust cover is open and the bolt is locked to the rear. To chamber around, I would send that bolt forward. That would put a round in the chamber. Then I would move the safety selector from safe to semi-automatic, pull the trigger and begin engaging targets until I ran out of ammunition. When I run out of ammunition, that bolt is gonna lock open again because again, the magazine is empty. I'm gonna have to take the magazine out. I'm gonna have to put a fresh magazine in with another complement of ammunition. Games that nail this manual of arms for an AR pattern rifle are the requirement in my mind. And it's always very frustrating whenever I see a game that doesn't get this sort of stuff 
right? Especially when it's common knowledge and you know there's a lot of uh, hobbyists that are shooting a lot on their free time. Anytime you see a manual of arms that's messed up, it's, uh, it's pretty frustrating. Ground Branch, again, gets the manual of arms right. Ready or not, as far as I have observed, gets the manual of arms right. But what's really interesting is manual of arms in virtual reality, because now you're actually manipulating this digital object with your hands in a three-dimensional environment, which means you need to know how to actually load and fire the weapon and how to reload the weapon in order to be successful. Onward does a great job of this. In fact, they nailed the manual of arms for the AK pattern and the AR pattern, and not long ago, they implemented the correct manual of arms for the MP5, requiring you to actually do that coveted H and K slap to send the bolt forward after you're done reloading to begin engaging targets. Next, I wanna talk about communication. Communication is critical in any tactical game, especially because one of the key components for a phenomenal tactical game is teamwork. And you have to be able to talk to your teammates to have teamwork. And the most common way to do that, of course, is using your voice. So communication is critical. And what you're looking at here is a replica ANPRC 152, which is a NATO radio. This is a replica version of it that I use because it is a the same form factor. It looks the same. It has the same controls mostly, and it fits all the same plugs and cables that the actual ANPRC 152 uses. So soldiers on the modern battlefield, police officers in law enforcement use radios to communicate with one another, with their higher headquarters and with adjacent elements. And the way that this is implemented in games is critical. And the way that this functionally works is you got a radio and the radio can usually work one channel at a time and you can talk to one network of people on the same frequency at a time. Certain radios can talk to more than one frequency at a time using multiple input methods. The ANPRC 152 that I've got here, I've got it set up to just work one channel at a time. It accomplishes that with the antenna on top, of course, the radio itself, and then I plug a push to talk into the top of the radio, route this cable across my plate carrier, through the shoulder pad, over to the front, where I have a push to talk key right here. So if I want to transmit, I simply push this button and I speak, and then I let go when I'm done speaking, that'll transmit to my platoon or my squad or whatever the case may be. In order to do that, I use these Peltor Comtacks to achieve that level of communication. As you can see here, they've got a down lead on these contacts. The cable plugs directly into this push to talk. And once it's plugged in, I've got my headset here. This provides hearing protection from firearms and explosives, as well as gives me the ability to communicate with my squad using that microphone again to transmit. All you gotta do is push that button, transmit to your buddies, let go, and you've sent your message. And this is a dual lead Peltor. So I actually have another plug over here. So in a real world situation, I would actually be running two channels at a minimum. So I'd have another PTT on the other side of my plate carrier. And if I needed to talk to my squad, I would push one button. If I needed to talk to my platoon or a different element, I would push the other button. Now there are games that emulate this level of functionality. Interestingly, the one that comes to mind is doing it the best is Squad. And that's because Squad allows you to turn up the volume or turn down the volume in either channel. So if you're a squad leader or a platoon leader playing the game Squad, you can actually control how loud you hear your teammates and you can actually choose which ear you hear them in. So I know that all communication, for example, coming through my left ear might be my squad and everything coming through my right ear might be from my platoon leader or from other squad leaders. This really helps transmit information throughout the formation. So as the platoon provides me with information, I can then relay it down to the members of my squad so that they all have a good idea and understanding of what is going on. Killed one on squad lead. I'm in contact close. Squad lead's in contact close. Squad lead has two EKA. My position need frags in this breach. Arma has some phenomenal communication infrastructure if you mod it correctly. Mods like TFAR allow you to simulate actual radio interaction. So if you're obstructed by a building or a hill, the frequencies that are being emitted from the antenna and from the radio may not actually make it over that hill mass or that hard structure to get to your teammates. That can be frustrating in a game, but if you're going for high levels of immersion, there's ways to achieve that with mods like TFAR and Acre in Arma. Anybody in Alpha? 
Go ahead and bounce it. Can you not hear him? He's doing comms check with him. One, two, from Alpha, radio check. Savage. Kilo one two one six. Uh, Savage from Alpha. Containment, containment south, established building seventy two. Copy off. One six. This is one two. Containment south is set. Building seventy two. Next, I want to talk about kit customization. Kit customization is critical in the real world, and it's equally critical in a tactical game worth its salt. And the reason I say that is because your kit will not look the same for every operation you go on. This kit is currently set up for the last Milsim event I did. I was a private, I was an assaulter, I was a rifleman. And so I didn't have a need for a lot of administrative functions. I didn't need a ton of sustainment uh, to keep me in the fight. So I had three mags up front, radio, push to talk, and a bottle of water and I was good to go. If I was going out for multiple days, I would have more ammunition, I'd bring more medical supplies. If I was a leader, I would have more radios, more push to talk. If I was a breacher, I would have specialty tools. And games that reflect this accurately are extremely impressive. The ones that come to mind are Ground Branch, Arma, and are the latest edition, which we haven't yet got our hands on in full, but Geronimo. And I wanna talk about Geronimo specifically because they've got a unique system in virtual reality that looks to let you modify your kit in a pretty profound way. So you can put all of your magazines exactly where you want them to be able to fight and you can bring all that specialty equipment your flashbangs and your breaching charges to accomplish exactly what you need to in order to win the fight so the play carrier i'm using here is actually a haley strategic thorax that was provided me from haley strategic and i'm super grateful that they did that it's a phenomenal little plate carrier i do have ballistic plates in it right now i've got their triple mag pouch up front but let's say i was going to go on a mission that required more than just three magazines or i needed additional sustainment well this thing is is extremely modular so just like in Geronimo I could take off this front panel and replace it with something like their micro and now with that quick swap out I still get three mags up front but I also get an administrative pouch and I get two pistol mags or a place to put a Gerber multi-tool or what have you but let's say that I was a breacher or maybe I was a dedicated combat lifesaver or first responder I would need to add some medical equipment or some shock tube and a breaching charge so I might need to add something like a dangler this is the Haley strategic version of the dangler it's just a simple general purpose pouch that can fit right underneath any one of their placards and now with the exact same plate carrier, I have a super robust sustainment capability. I can carry more ammunition and bring more capability to the fight. I think games that emulate this level of customization are critical and provide the user with a really compelling and interesting experience that keeps them engaged and gives them a better chance to accomplish the mission. Next, I want to talk about a medical system. I think medical systems are really important in tactical games. Unfortunately, they're often overlooked. And Ground Branch, for example, which has been kind of the king of tactical shooters that we've talked about today, doesn't even have a medical systems. And the ones that do, like Ready or Not, um, usually just have a bandage system, meaning that if you're wounded, you just press and hold a button and you bandage yourself and then you're back in the fight or maybe you bleed out. In reality, blood loss is certainly the greatest killer on the battlefield. And unfortunately, the way that we fight blood loss is usually with tourniquets, not with bandages. So this is my gun belt and I carry a couple tourniquets. I carry at least one on my plate carrier and then also one on my gun belt and then additional one in my actual aid kit. My aid kit's here on uh, kind of the small of my back on my gun belt. And then I've got a tourniquet right next to it. And if we take a look at the tourniquet, this is a cat tourniquet. It's already fit to get all the way around my thigh. The way this thing works is you just open it up like this. You slide it on to the appendage that is bleeding as high as you possibly can, as close to the torso as possible. You open the Velcro. You crank it down as tight as you can possibly get it. Once you crank it down, you take this stick right here, it's called a windlass, and you spin it, you rotate it as much as you can. Once it's rotated until it can rotate no more and the bleeding has confirmed to be stopped, you pin that windlass right here in the capture area, you tape it down with that flap, you write the time that that tourniquet was placed on that appendage, and then you check it periodically or every time you move the casualty to ensure that it hasn't moved and the bleeding hasn't started once again. And I think a tourniquet system would be extremely beneficial to most of these tactical shooters. I don't know of a game that implements one. Arma has an extremely interesting uh, medical system, but the medical system itself is kind of like a menu and you have to know when to provide drugs, when to push blood, when to provide plasma, when to, you know, give various medications. Um, and then you also do have to stop bleeding. You have to identify the right appendage, but there's no animation that shows a tourniquet actually going on. Sorry, bud. <laughs> 
Yeah, so now it's all yellow, and then you should so, be able to do all this stuff there. Yep, apply tourniquet, do bandages. We can't push blood, so... It's only I'm medics can push medic blood. Can. So super simple and authentic fix for a lot of these games would just be, instead of doing the bandage thing, do the tourniquet thing and get a couple realism points out of it in the process. And the last thing I want to talk about is fire support. Inherent to any combined arms maneuver is fire support. It's difficult for infantry or armor formations to move unless they've got fire support to suppress the enemy or enable their offensive maneuvers. I think this is critically important, especially in player versus player games. And I think the games that implement it the best in my mind are Arma and then Squad and Post Scriptum. I played a lot of Post Scriptum back in the day and I really enjoyed playing as a squad leader. In Post Scriptum, the platoon leader controls all of the fire support and, you know, it's it's relatively scarce, I mean, you can't employ it constantly, but if I, as a squad leader, saw an issue on the battlefield, I could mark that target using an in-game interface that placed an icon on the objective and then radio to my squad leader requesting for fire support. Squad also has a system like this that's pretty effective. Yeah, I got eyes on an enemy support by fire position marking. Squad 2, request mortars, Hotel 6, 6-6, six, six, marked with my observe and a mortar request. Shot out, mortars are on the way, boys. You've got one enemy prone trying to get the machine gunner up right now. Mortars are in the air. One enemy, he's getting the machine gunner up right now. He's on my side of the machine gun. Direct hit. Fuck yeah. They are on target, brother. You just got three. But the most compelling way to implement fire support is definitely in Arma because it's other players that are actually operating the delivery systems that put effects on the battlefield. Ooh. Understood. Just be advised. Friendlies are all inside of that uh, BP perimeter you see there. So you are weapons tight. That is a no fires area inside the perimeter. You are weapons free outside of that. Break, break, break. I need close air support running south to north 10 meters west of TRP2. I have 20 plus foot mobiles. RTO, get it up there now. And, uh... On it. Cast from okay, airs. TRP2, 20 packs. Cleared hot. On my muzzle. I'm gonna need help on this side. I'm about to get over on. Falling back. Roger, fall back. Alamo, Alamo, Alamo. Three, two, one, engage. Frag out, frag out. Is he in front of us? Cleared hot, direct south. Good effects, good effects. They're on our perimeter from our location, 150 meters. You're cleared inbound, north to south. calling some AI. And there's perhaps no better example than the hot exfil that we did just last week in the video linked on screen right now in what I think is the most compelling representation of a special operations raid that has ever been attempted in a video game. Still get some sporadic gunfire from over there. All units be advised, one time today I'm approaching the south east on top of the hill. Break, break, Titan. Looks like we have one military age male. Currently coming at you from the southeast, it's on top of the mountain. Break, break, make that one fire team size element. Oh. Titan, one six. Uh, tell Reaper he's clear, hot, if he can hit those without hitting friendly, over. Break, break, break. One time fire team element, southeast, pressing the hill. We're committed at this point. That call, Xville, Xville, Xville. Xville, Xville, Xville. Two copies. Four I'm on the right gun, boys. Get on, get on the gun. Get on all the guns. Confirm no eagles, rooftop. All right, engaging. Rifle, time on target, 10 seconds.
all out. Guys, I hope that you've enjoyed today's video. I really tried to make it interesting and describe how some of these features make tactical games more compelling and more interesting. But the most important thing about a tactical game is that it's fun, that you enjoy it, and that you have a good time doing it. If you liked any of the games that I talked about today, I'd encourage you to go take a look at them on my game store, consider purchasing them from over there. And if you're not yet subscribed to the channel, I'd invite you guys to do that now. Thanks for watching. I'm Controlled Pairs. This has been a recap of the best and most important tactical features in tactical games. And I'll see you guys in the next one.